Episode 8, My Conversation with Mark Whitaker. The FBI would wire me up at 6 o'clock every morning, and they would say, Mark, if these guys catch you, they're going to kill you if they catch you wearing a wire. And to wear a wire 8, 9, or 10 hours a day when my life was at risk was the most adversity I've ever went through in my life. I'm Paul Estridge, and this is Survive in Advance, a show from the People Forward Network. Let's learn to face life's greatest challenges and move forward together. By the age of 32, Mark Whitaker had a mansion, a private jet, and was on track to become the president of one of the largest companies in the world. That all changed when he got caught up in an illegal international price-fixing scheme. Eventually, he was given a choice, go to prison or become an informant. In our conversation, you'll hear how he survived the mental strain of wearing a wire for three years and how discovering his purpose helped him thrive, even while serving a federal prison sentence. Did your realization of the international cartel in the price fixing, when they introduced you to them, was it a sudden realization as to what was going on, or, or did you gradually get acclimated to that environment like a frog in boiling water? No, it was it was pretty quick. They gave me a hundred thousand dollar check bonus, and they gave me twenty five thousand shares of stock. Between the two, that was about a million dollars. And it was at a time when they gave me that was not our normal performance review time. So it was kind of odd because it wasn't about increased profits, increased growth. It was kind of an odd timing to get that uh, particular bonus. But an hour later, I knew what it was for. They came back about an hour later, uh, the vice chairman did, and, and said that, Mark, we trust you now. You're part of the family. And they said that they're going to bring me, uh, they're going to start sharing with me how they do business. And I said, well, I've been here two years. I'm divisional president and corporate vice president. I know how we do business. And they said, no, there's some things going on they have not shared. And that's when they shared about the price fixing scheme. And I made a comment. I said, well, that's that's illegal. And that's when the, the vice chairman said, Mark, everybody does it. The laws were put on the books in the 1800s by politicians that don't know anything about business. Those laws should not even be on the books. You can't be in the commodity business and not do this. This is the way business is done. And at that point, I would have been 34, so I'm still fairly young, not even a decade out of college yet. And I'm thinking, well, these guys are 75 and 69, and and they know a lot more about business than me. And I start thinking, well, this must be how business is done. That, and they told me that's exactly how business is done in the real world. So I started justifying it just like they justified it to me. And how long were you in that justification period of time until you told your wife what was going on and everything changed? It was about seven months later when I shared my wife. That was in April of 92 when that happened. I shared with my wife in November uh, 92. And, and it was really weighing on me. I was, I was thinking, why were such a successful company? Zero debt, five billion in cash, seven, 70 billion in revenue. Why would we be stealing when we're already successful without any of that? It added extra profit, but we were doing well. We were doubling our stock every three or four years. We were already an extremely successful company. So it weighed on me. And my wife really noticed that. That's when the conversation started. She said, Mark, something's changed. She said, I've known you since a teenager in junior high, junior high school. And she said, something's changed and about you. And, and I can tell something's weighing on you. And that's when I opened up and shared it with her. And what did she say? Well, that's when she didn't know what she was a stay-at-home mom raising three young children. She didn't even never even heard the words price fixing, didn't even know what it was. But she did know, once she asked me if it was illegal, and I said, yes, it is illegal, that's when the red flags really came up from her. Even though she didn't understand all the mechanics uh, behind it, once she knew it was illegal, she had a big problem with it, tremendously so. And what did she say? Well, she said, how much does the company earn? And I said, well, we make hundreds of millions of dollars, sometimes a billion dollars a year 
from this scheme. And she said, how long they've been doing it? I said, well, over a decade. I said, this has been going on for years. This isn't new. Even though I'm new into it, it's not a new thing. That It's not a new scheme. It's been going on. And she said, well, who really pays that extra billion dollars a year uh, that the company's earning? She said, when, like, you sell ingredients to a Kellogg's or a or a Coca-Cola or a Tyson Foods, do they pay it? And I said, well, they pay it, but they have their profit margins built in. So if Kellogg's or any of these food additive, Pillsbury and Kraft and any of these process food processing that you buy your products from the grocery store, when they buy these ingredients, they're going to have their profit margin built in. So the increase in prices of the ingredients is getting passed to the consumer. So I said, really, the consumer's are paying for this around the world. And that's when she said, you mean my mom, my grandma, my dad, everybody goes to the grocery store is paying extra for this. And and we're living in a 13,000 square foot house with an eight car garage. And she said, I got a real problem with this, Mark. And then she told me she was going to go back in her study and pray about it. And that's when I knew I was in trouble. Were you a believer at that time? I was not. I was not. I became a believer at age 40. I was 34 at that time. So she went back into her study, and you knew you were in trouble? Yeah, and she came back out and said that. She said, hey, Mark, this is where God's leading her. You've got to turn yourself in, and we got to do it today. You're seven months into this. What a perfect time to do the right thing. It's not like you've done it 12 years. This is the time to do the right thing. So then you went to the FBI straight? Yes, we did. Shared with the FBI for almost four hours. And it became, at that point, uh, the largest price-fixing case in U.S. history, started by my wife, Ginger, a stay-at-home mom. And what happened after that? Well, I had um, I had a choice the day I shared with the FBI. I, I just opened up about the largest price-fixing scheme in U.S. history. So I had a choice to either be arrested or, or wear a wire. I chose to wear a wire. I got wired up the next day and wore a wire every day for almost three years from 1992 to, to 1995. And and they got evidence, uh, amazing evidence from all around the world that all this was occurring. And it became a huge case. Multiple people went to prison. Um, I had full immunity. They were so appreciative. When they wired me up, they said, Mark, if these guys catch you, they're going to kill you. I mean, this is serious stuff. This is billionaires and people from around the world. This is like the mob you're talking about here. They, they felt like strongly that they wouldn't just take a gun and, and shoot me, but they had the whereabouts with the wealth that they had that they could have someone do like an accident and, and they would be hands off for them and they wouldn't even be known to be involved themselves. But, you know, being some of them being billionaires, all of them being millionaires and some of them even billionaires, and they just had the whereabouts, uh, the wherewithal where they could really – make something happen. So they were concerned for my life. It was an international cartel. Most of the competitors were not even from inside the the U.S. And most of our meetings were outside the U.S., most of them, that where we met with our competitors. So the FBI had to set all that up and meet with the embassy and to make sure they could get uh, a a camera, a lamp, for example, that had the video camera in it into the right places to video. Because I did the audio, but they also wanted to video these crimes that were occurring. And so they gave me full immunity, uh, never to do one day uh, in prison because they were so appreciative. So I had full immunity. And what I went to prison for was something totally different where I kind of panicked at towards the end, thinking about after wearing a wire and they're telling me it's coming to an end. I'm thinking, well, who's going to hire someone wore a wire against their own company for three years? And I'm in my 30s. It's going to be easier to it'd be easier to get a job as a felon than someone that's a whistleblower or wore a wire against their own company. So I'm thinking I'm a little over a decade out of college. My career's coming to an end. Uh, I was about 38 by the time the three years was coming in wearing a wire. And I had lots of stock options. Most of my income was in stock options. Uh, You know, the base salary was in, as mentioned earlier, was in the six figures, but the stock options was in the seven figures. And I knew I was going to get fired before I could exercise them. So I'm going to be leaving millions on the table. So I ended up writing five checks for $9 million to myself from the company. I had that kind of power. I could do that. And I wrote five checks to myself. And I thought if it ever did come out and get exposed, I have stock options to prove that they owed me that. So I justified in my own mind, this is okay. They owe me this. 
because if I was there a long a year longer, that's what I would have got. And then what happened with that thinking? Anything over two hundred fifty thousand above, the COO had to sign, so he was signing them. But uh, he also knew, you know, he knew it was going to me, and the company's still in a billion dollars a, a, a year, so it was kind of hard to turn me in because mine was minuscule compared to that. Uh, so he signed them. And the day they learned that I was the informant, they called the FBI and said, uh, Mark Whitaker's no white knight uh, informant. He stole $9 million from us the same time he's working for the FBI. So the FBI comes to my house. They meet with Ginger and I. They ask Mark, what's this $9 million that we're hearing about? What's happening here? And I shared with them what happened. And they said, Mark, uh, you're going to lose your immunity agreement because of this. But we support you. We know you made some bad decisions under pressure. We're going to do everything we can do for you. And they got me a six-month plea agreement, six months in federal prison, a deal of a lifetime they got for me. So did you spend six months in prison? No, I did not. Uh, My lawyer called me in Chicago, said, Mark, your deal of a lifetime. All you have to do is sign this plea agreement. Six months in prison, a Martha Stewart sentence. And uh, my wife started begging. She said, Mark, just sign it. Let's put this behind us. Let's you're going at age 38. You come out at age 38. Let's put it behind us. And I looked at Ginger and I said, Ginger, you're the one that got me in this mess in the first place. I had to wear a wire for three years because of you. I'm going to do the opposite you want me to do. And I ripped up that plea agreement and did not sign it and went through the courts for almost three years and got eight and a half years instead by not signing that plea agreement. Oh, my goodness. My own worst enemy every step of the way. This may seem obvious, but were you being vindictive at that time? Just my pride. Uh, and, I, and, you know, after wearing a wire for three years, I had not hardly slept. I mean, I was out. Neighbors had seen me three in the morning blowing leaves off the gas leaf blower in thunderstorms. <laughs> I mean, I was losing it wearing a wire. So I, I wasn't thinking clearly. I was mad that I had to wear a wire three years and still go to prison for six months after all that. I felt like that was worse than prison. And I was just so mad and, and being vindictive and and just mad at her that I was in that whole mess and wanted to blame somebody. and and did not accept the responsibility and do the six months and therefore got eight and a half years instead. When you tore it up, did you think, no, I, I'd rather do eight and a half years. Did you know that was coming? No, no, I didn't. I didn't. I thought my my defense about what they really owed me, you know, owing me millions through stock options, if I would have stayed there, if I would have met the exercise date, which would have been about a year after I was let go and fired because I was the the informant, um, I felt like that would was really a strong defense. I was wrong, but in my mind, I thought that's a strong defense, that the company owed me that, and if I was still there at the company, they would have paid me that, legally. So I know you've said that the most difficult thing you've ever had to endure and experience is that time you were wearing a wire. Yes. Take us back there. How did you mentally, as difficult as it was, and you had some... Sometimes you weren't so together, but as difficult as as it was, how did you survive that? You weren't a believer. So what what was it that was within you, or what is it you did to get through every day? Was there something you kept focused on, or is there something that you thought was at the end of this that would make it all worthwhile? Did you have a purpose for this? I really did not have a purpose. I would say I didn't even have a purpose in my life uh, at that point in my life, except make as much money as I could, as fast as I could. It was the wrong purpose. It was, it was definitely a, the way the world defines success. Not a, I, I would say it was not a life of significance at that point in my thirties. It was a very selfish, you know, a selfish leader, not a servant leader at that time. But what kept me going is I'm, you know, first they told me it'd be six weeks, then they said it'd be six months. So I'm always thinking we're close to the end of me wearing a wire. It ended up being three years, but they kept saying, we're almost there, we're almost there. So that kept me going by them saying, we're almost there. So you go to prison, and uh, mm-hmm. gosh, that's going to feel awful. you got eight and a half years in front of you. Yeah. How was that experience? As hard as it was compared to wearing a wire, it was a cakewalk. I had my first good night's sleep when I went to prison, knew it's over, I'm safe. Uh, Ginger said she had her first good night's sleep 
uh, when I was in prison. She knew I was, oh, you know, it was over that I was safe because she just w- always worried about me getting caught. So yeah, as hard as it was, it was not as hard as wearing a wire for sure. So Mark, I can't listen to your story without thinking of of your family and how incredibly difficult this would be for them to uh, survive it and to stick together and to be there for you when you came out of prison. How, how was it that they were able to, to do that? Well, my wife, she gets interviewed a lot, Ginger, and she would say it's her, her faith. Her flesh was saying, wow, this is a mess. Need to get away from it. Need to run. Uh, on national news, she did an interview on CBS News uh, years ago, and they asked her when she was the most mad, and she said it was when I took a six-month plea agreement and threw it away and blamed her for the whole mess. But she also said, looking back, she said, thank God I didn't sign a six-month sentence. I would have never listened to an Ian Howes and then Chuck Colson, who poured into me all those years. I would have never listened to them with a six-month sentence. And I think she's right. I would have not listened to them with a six-month sentence. And she feels I would have come out the same man I went in. And I think she's right. I think six-month sentence would not have broken me. So it was the prison time that broke you? I would say... I would say that it was the prison that took all those distractions of where my focus was, house, greed, moving up the corporate ladder. For eight and a half years, I'm going to be $20 a month for eight and a half years. So all that is out of the equation. Therefore, I looked at where everything that I focused on is not even anything I can focus on the next eight and a half years uh, in terms of corporate ladder and, and position and and I said, who knows if I even have that opportunity again, even after being a convicted felon and coming out of prison at age 49. But on the other hand, those distractions were out of the way. And I'm seeing my family and my kids every weekend with no cell phone and no laptop and no TV and no distractions. It was just my family. And I started helping guys in prison get their GEDs. And some of the ones that were uh, international, like Spanish, learn how to speak English and write English and 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 I tell you something, Paul, they became the most productive years of my life at $20 a month because the first time in my life I'm helping somebody else that I'd never done before. If you were talking to a young man, 38 years old, who was facing the same situation that you're faced, what would you tell him to get through all of this? I would tell him this. I became a Christian my first year of prison, so that's when my life— I attempted suicide twice before I went to prison, so that's kind of when I got to the end of myself. When I knew I could have had immunity, which I had, and then a six-month deal, which I could have had, and now eight and a half years, I, I tried to take my life twice before going to prison. I mean, I was at the, I was hopeless and helpless by that point. And so I went into prison broken, completely broken. Uh, knowing I had eight and a half years and what I put my family through. And, you know, reality sinking in that, that you know, I'm doing eight and a half years after wearing a wire for three. And and the reality of that, all and on all decisions of my own making, I had no one to blame but myself. Uh, it was so depressing. And uh, went to prison, became a Christian. A couple guys reached out to me, one before prison and another one named Chuck Colson as I entered prison. My second week, he reached out to me. He went to prison in the 70s for Watergate. He was the White House counsel for President Nixon. He read about me in the Washington Post and reached out to me. And I tell you, those guys reaching out to me, when everybody else in my life was kind of, besides my family, were kind of running away from me. And then these guys reaching out and introduced me to God and and sharing about God with me and and sharing that God would redeem me even with all these mistakes that I've made and he would forgive me. I I mean, it was a process, several month process, but it it was life-changing for me. So if I was talking to someone 38 that's kind of right in the middle of the same situation, I would be telling them, get to know God because it's the only way you're going to get through it. So you say you tried to commit suicide a couple of times you're not a believer during this period. You didn't. What would you tell someone in order to keep going, not quit, not to do that? Well, I'm so glad the suicide attempts did not work. The reason why I tried to kill myself, it was for all the wrong reasons. I mean, I thought I was going to lose my family. I had life insurance for a long time. 
So I felt like the life insurance would be better for my family than me in prison. I was thinking that, but I was wrong on all of those. My family, I thought I'd lose my family. I'm married 43 years here, uh, coming up in June in a couple months and closer and stronger than ever. Our kids are, I got to know them better in prison than I ever did before. So, I mean, all the things that I worried about ended up not be true. I got a job the day I got out of prison, eventually became the COO of that company. And and still on their advisory board even still today. So, I mean, all the things that I worried about, how would my family survive financially? I mean, at $20 a month, I couldn't help them much. But uh, the companies that were the victims of the case gave Ginger a whistleblower reward uh, my first year in prison. And they took care of my family financially for nine years. The very companies I was stealing from, the victims who won hundreds of millions in class action suits that sued, you know, ADM for the price fixing, uh, we're so appreciative of me wearing a wire and appreciative, especially for Ginger starting the case, that they took care of Ginger and my children during the time. So all these things that I worried about when I became hopeless and helpless ended up being false. So one of the principles that I talk about is accepting our, our situation and our condition and surrendering to the reality of what we're going to have to get through. When was that acceptance period for you and you ultimately had to surrender? The acceptance for me for sure would have been my first year in prison. I went into prison in March of 98 at age 40. I became a Christian in June of 98, had just turned 41 the month earlier uh, Chuck Colson had, had had kind of helped me remove that science block. So Chuck Colson led me to uh, to Christ because he helped me work through that where you can't be a PhD scientist and be a Christian. And in reality, I don't know how you can be a PhD scientist and not believe in God. And I tell you the story I'll never forget was Nehemiah, that he shared with me that Nehemiah accepted the situation that he was a cupbearer for the king. And I'll never forget Chuck Colson sharing this. He feels like Nehemiah was the book of uh, new beginnings. And he ended up building a wall around Jerusalem in 52 days. And he was a cupbearer for the king. I mean, he got out of his comfort zone, but he, he took the reality that things were bad in Jerusalem. So he was sharing that with me, the book of Nehemiah, how Nehemiah accepted the reality that the Jerusalem walls were torn down. They were on fire. And and the gates were on fire, and and the people were distressed, and and a lot of anxiety because they had no wall to protect them, and and he just looked at it he, that things are not good, and this is reality, and he prayed about it. Actually, prayed about it for almost three months, and God put him in Jerusalem to help build the wall and lead the efforts to build the wall around Jerusalem in 52 days. And Chuck Colson was going through that with me in June of 98. And he's using that to say, Mark, you've got to accept your reality. You're in prison for the next eight and a half years. You're three months into it. You've got eight years left. And it started making me, but at that point, I believed in God and surrendered my life to Jesus. And I accepted that I've got eight years in prison yet to do. So how can I do it and do it in a productive way? And that's when I started being where God put on my heart to be creative. Just like Nehemiah built that wall around Jerusalem, I help guys get to know God. I help guys get their GEDs. I help someone learn how to speak English, learn how to write English. And I just started being productive. Did that become your purpose? It did. It absolutely did. I said, my purpose is going to be serve others. And I said, God, you get me through this. I'll serve others the rest of my life. And it has been. I, I learned how rewarding it is to be a servant leader because I never was one prior to age 41. Became the purpose of my life, was helping others improve their life. Mark, what keeps you going now? What keeps me going now is, is my family, that my family stayed with me and loved me through some of the toughest years for a decade and also continuing to serve. I started discipling guys in prison, introduced them to God. We call it a Paul-Timothy relationship, just like Chuck Colson was to me. Chuck was my Paul. I was a Timothy. Mm -hmm. And I've been, I got five Timothys now that I, I pour into. And I'll have Timothys, the, and it's about a two-year program called Operation Timothy. And I'll have Timothys the rest of my life pouring into them. 
And then my job in a ministry at Coca-Cola Consolidated, we have chaplain at every plant, prayer groups and Bible studies. So I'm involved on the culture side, uh, integrating faith and work. So God's given me another chance, but this time more as a, as a ministry, not in a in the business side. Now, when I first got out, I was in biotech business in the business side, and God blessed me with that to stabilize my family. And But now in my 60s, I, I get to do ministry, uh, disciple people, and help them integrate faith in their work and help them become the servant leaders that God designed them to be. And ju- and really just kind of like duplicating what Chuck Colson did with me. I have the chance to do, and I want to do that until I, I, I meet Jesus in heaven. I want to do that. So it's been a, uh, the last 16, 17 years since I've been released. It's, it's definitely been as a servant and, and, and not, and I don't care about having a corporate jet. I don't have one. That doesn't mean anything to me or having a mansion or eight cars. It's just, I've learned how so rewarding it is in prison to serve others. And it's a lot more rewarding than a big stock options that's in the seven figures to see someone else improve their life. For me, the biggest lesson from Mark's story was that when he found himself in deep trouble, within time, he accepted it. He faced it. And ultimately, he surrendered. He fully accepted his crimes. And he fully accepted what was put in front of him. And through that surrender, He truly found his salvation and purpose in life. You see, in life, we never move forward and advance until we fully accept and surrender to the situations that we're facing. And sometimes they're brought on by ourselves. It's not brought on from anything from the outside. It's our own actions. And that process takes time. But don't expect any kind of true movement or advancement in life until we surrender to the full situation. Thanks for listening to Survive and Advance, a show from the People Forward Network. I'm Paul Estridge, reminding you to keep moving forward and always be grateful. Let's stay connected. Send me an email at surviveinadvance at estridge.net.